does everybody like looking up Bible texts? <laughs> okay. Uh, seems to be my thing here lately is to have you look up a bunch of texts, but um, that's less of me and more of God that way. You know, I, I like to kind of like it that way, and it keeps us uh, to be interactive a little bit. And, and, uh, but uh, today's title is uh, Dig Your Well Before You're Thirsty. You know, the title comes from a book uh, with the same title by Harvey Mackay. Um, I have not read the book. I'll make that clear now. But the title illustrates a simple yet important fact of life. Uh, you know, you cannot wait until you are thirsty to dig a well. You know, if you do, uh, you might likely die of thirst before you get the water that you need. You need to prepare ahead of time. We need to prepare ahead of time, don't we? Uh, we need to prepare ahead of time before troubles arise or before needs arise. And I think this principle also parallels the Christian life. You know, there are times of spiritual thirst, aren't there? Um, and if we wait until such times to dig our wells, we may be too late. We need to be digging our wells now. Uh, like no other time in earth's history, if we look what's going on around us, uh, we are living in perilous times and things are happening rapidly and we know things are going to even get worse. We need to have some reserve, don't we? We need to have a well that we can tap into for these times. So let's turn to the Bible. And I think the Bible has some things there that... Uh, uh, that tells us that we might need a well for. And the first text I'd like to go to is in Acts chapter 17, verses 30 to 31. I'm going to turn to each text so you'll have plenty of time to get there. Acts 17, 30 to 31. I'm not there yet, Frank. <laughs> uh, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. God has declared a day of judgment, and he is declared a person to who he will appoint this judgment through. One who he has raised from the dead, that would be Jesus. The Bible also tells us that we are going to, that we'll all stand before Jesus. And Frank shared a text in Romans 14, verses 10 to 12, saying that we will all stand before Jesus. Do you know that day of salvation? That day of judgment, well, that day of judgment will be a day of salvation for some, but for others it's going to be condemnation. Matthew 25, if you'll turn there with me. Matthew 25, verse 34, it tells us that Jesus is saying here, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then others will hear, will hear terrible words. If we look to verse 41, then he will also say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. You know, on that day, it'll be too late to begin digging wells. If we're spiritually thirsty on that day, it'll be too late if we hear those terrible words, wouldn't it? What are some other things we might need a well for besides a day of judgment? How about in times of temptation? You know, the Christian life is, uh, uh, and I want to use this word, fraught or filled with temptation, right? 
Every once in a while, I got to throw a big word in there, you know. <laughs> but uh, it's true. Um, and we've heard the warnings. When you get baptized, look out. Satan's going to attack you. But I suggest that every day, walking with the Lord, Satan's attacking us. And as we grow closer to the end of time, Satan really seems to be turning it on, doesn't he? Yeah. Temptations are everywhere. And, uh, you know, the Bible tells us that these temptations are because of our adversary, the devil, right? 1 Peter 5, 8. The Satan, the devil, is walking around like a roaring lion, seeking who he can devour or destroy, right? Well, how about because of our own fleshly desires? Turn with me to James 1.14. Should have brought my readers. No, that's okay, Frank. I'm good. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Our own lust can tempt us and get us into trouble. How about Mark 7, verses 21 to 23? Jesus tells us here, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. Temptation shouldn't be taken lightly. And when they hit us, we need a well already dug. You know, the, these temptations, uh, we can become hardened. And uh, our hearts can become hardened and, uh, because of the deceitfulness of sin. And that we might even fall away from God, falling into these temptations. Let's go to Luke 8, 13. And Jesus speaking here again says, Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no firm root. They believe for a while, and in time of temptation, fall away. Do we have wells right now to quench our spiritual thirst when we're tempted? Sometimes I wonder if I do. Uh, it seems that I'm always caught off guard. I get to work. I got guys there that I uh, befriended. I'm, uh, you know, we get along and, and you have that casual conversation. It seems every time it's like I get drug into some conversation. It's like, this is not Christ-like. Why am I here laughing and getting along with this? I didn't have a, my well dug to avoid such times. You know, I don't want to, you know, be disrespectful or unfriendly to others, but if I get carried away in this conversation, what do others think of me whenever I try to be a witness? It's a temptation. It's a temptation. And do I have a well dug that I can draw from to watch out for these things? Also, is it not good to have a well prepared for periods of tribulation? Again, the Christian life is not always easy, is it? You know, Jesus warned the apostles in John 16, verse 33.
And there Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. But take courage, I have overcome the world. Jesus himself warns us that we'll have tribulation in the Christian life. Paul warned the disciples about tribulations. Acts 14, verses 21 and 22. The Bible tells us here in Acts, After they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Interesting little story here. I'll expound a little bit on this one. It was Paul and I think, uh, was it uh, Barnabas? Barnabas were preaching the gospel in uh, Lystra there. And wow, boy, the, the, the people there, Paul, they looked at him as creating a miracle. What he heals a, a man there that was, uh, I'm not sure what his physical ailment was, but he jumps up and all the people are saying, look, these guys are God's made men, referring to Greek and Roman uh, mythology gods, you know, for so forth. Then when Paul hears this, he's like, whoa, 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 we've got the wrong thing here, you know. And as he's trying to explain to them, no, this is God who does the miracles, you know, he's the one who did the healing and the God who made the heavens and, and the earth and so forth. And then... I don't know where the Jews come in and they start talking to this multitude of people and they kind of win them over. And the next thing you know, Paul was getting stoned, thought he was dead. They took him outside the city and threw him out there and left him for dead. Now you want to talk about a rough day at work. Uh, you want to talk about tribulations. You know, uh, I pray that the, our tribulations won't be quite that bad if we preach the gospel to be stoned and carried out of the city. But our, uh, the tribulations that we face as a Christian are quite diverse, aren't they? And they, they come our ways. Uh, and some tribulations are just because we are Christians. 2 Timothy 3.12 Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 3.12, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Other tribulations are because we, uh, we share in the frailties of life. Uh, in life, the righteous and the wicked in, have to deal with sickness, pain, death, economic recession, loss of jobs, terrorism, war, natural calamities, viruses. As Christians, friends, we better have our wells dug in advance if we are to survive such spiritual droughts. In digging our wells, we need to remember what God has provided for us. Amen? Amen. You're all so quiet attentively. I'm like, this, this, this. <laughs> uh, and the reason for so many texts is because I want God to do the speaking here today. Amen. Um, but what has God provided for us in the way of uh, wells? Well, how about his son, Jesus? Amen. Has God not provided his son for us? Let's look at 1 John 4, verses 9 and 10. In 1 John 4, beginning in verse 9, it says, By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us 
and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Praise the Lord. How about the, uh, the gospel itself, the good news, the good news of salvation to the world? God has provided that for us, hasn't he? And what, what must we do in this process here? Well, we need to respond. We need to respond to the gospel of his grace. And also, how about remain faithful to Jesus? Remain faithful to the gospel. Let's, uh, let's go to Revelation 2.10. And there Jesus is talking to the church at Smyrna. And there he says, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto, the, unto death and I will give you the crown of life. And I pray that we are not thrown into prison or tested in harsh ways, although we may. But the point is, is be faithful. Be faithful to Jesus. Be faithful to the gospel until death. And here Jesus himself has promised us uh, a crown of life. <clears throat> Have you begun digging your wells by obeying Jesus Christ? How about in preparing for temptation? Has God provided anything for us there? How about his providence? Uh, God has provided his providence in time of temptation. You know that God will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able to stand. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Let's read that. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. How often I forget that text. You know, the Bible tells us that God is able to work all things for our good. What else has God given us to help us uh, have a well for temptation? What did Jesus say when he ascended into heaven? Uh, he said unless when he would depart, he would send us a comforter, the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead, has come to help us to overcome, hasn't he, in time of temptation? You know, it's the Holy Spirit is sent to us to strengthen that inner man. We need to read some text on that. Let's go to Ephesians 3.16. There in Ephesians 3.16... The Bible tells us that, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Amen. Amen. Lost my place here. Let's see what uh, Romans 8, verses 12 to 14 say here. Romans 8, verses 14 to 16. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Amen. 
What a powerful ally in time of temptation, the Holy Spirit. Again, to his son, Jesus. Jesus is our advocate and propitiation. Jesus, who stands ready to assist us when we have sinned, doesn't he? He has promised us if we repent and confess our sins, he is righteous and just to forgive us. It's Jesus' blood who cleanses us from all sins when we confess, isn't it? Amen. What about family? Is it possible to have family support us in our efforts? You know, we have the Father, we have the Son, the Holy Spirit. What about uh, our brothers and sisters? Let's look to 1 Timothy 5, verses 1 and 2. Here in chapter uh, 5, verses 1 and 2 in 1 Timothy, Do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather appeal to him as a father, to the younger men as brothers, the older women as mothers, and the younger women as sisters in all purity. Amen. Amen. Yep. Amen. What is another thing that God has provided for us or asked us to do in times of temptation? How about pray? Is that not a provision of God? Pray that we not enter into temptation. What did Jesus teach on the Sermon on the Mount? Let's go to Matthew 6.13. Matthew 6.13. I warned there was a lot of text. Jesus says here in the Lord's Prayer, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 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 How can we become filled with the Holy Spirit? Do we become filled with the Holy Spirit by imbibing the word? How about singing praises and making melody in our hearts to the Lord? Teaching one another in song, letting the word dwell in us richly. Colossians 3.16. Let's investigate that text. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Amen. You know, when we lift each other up, when we come together in a worship service, uh, we're, we're filling that well up for in time of, times of temptation. And God has, has given us one another. Uh, to be together as, as like believers, um, to get us through tough times as well, huh? To get us through temptations, tribulations. You know, we also develop and strengthen our relationships together as well as with God uh, as we commune with God in prayer together and as we exhort one another. How about when we repent and confess sins to one another? What does God say? Well, we know we need to repent and confess our sins to God. 1 John 1, 9. Let's begin there. It 
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And to one another, James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And I would uh, reserve some of the more sensitive things in our lives to God. But there may be those things that we might want to confess to one another. And it's in God's word that uh, there is much power in confessing our sins with one another. And uh, again, these things are digging our wells for in times of temptation, for in times of tribulation. Can we really depend on one another? Can we look to one another here in times of trouble? I think we can. I pray we can. Uh, you see God working here in this congregation, in this church, and I praise him for that. More on preparing your wells for tribulation. More things that God has provided for us here. How about hope? Does God provide us hope? He provides us hope to help us endure. Uh, more text. How about Romans 12, verse 12? Romans 12, 12 tells us, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. Amen. Amen. I hope I'm not putting you all to sleep here this morning. Another text is in 1 Peter 1, 3 to 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, long more precious than gold, which is perishable, even through tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you will not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Amen. And I'm trying to broaden the text, Miss Penny. So <laughs> I remember, I remember. Uh, God has provided hope in times of tribulation. And this hope is empowered and strengthened by the Holy Spirit. How about peace? God has given us peace. Uh, a peace that only Jesus can give us in times of tribulation. You know, that peace that Jesus gives us can guard our hearts and our minds. We've talked about the brethren, how they can comfort one another. How do we focus our hope? Focus our hope, how do we, uh, I'm trying to read my notes here. We can focus our hope by setting our minds on the grace to be revealed, 1 Peter 1, 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace 
to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. One of the things I think about there is, is uh, what was it? Uh, I had my granddaughter just talk to me the other night, and she's like, what's the hereafter like? And I'm like, I'm not quite sure where she's going with that. And I said, well, the hereafter. What would be good? Let's open up the Bible and see what the Bible says. And so I took her to Revelation, and I let her read for herself about new heaven and new earth, and about a place where we'll be with God continually, where there is no pain, no suffering, no death. And as she was reading this, I could tell she was being a little more comforted by this. I'm not sure what she was thinking, you know. And then she wanted to know about, well, if we didn't go to heaven. And I just thought about it for a moment, and I said, well, what did you know before you were born? nothing and I said well it's unfortunate for those who won't be saved I said but that's what will happen you just won't know anything anymore God's not a tyrant he's not going to roast you in eternal fire forever and ever you know Satan's not in charge of anything uh, there is a punishment and so forth but and I took her to various Bible passages and this is when I get a little uh, uh discouraged I want to look to see what's um, what God has promised what what we're waiting for and that's to be with him to be in heaven and lift lift yourself up by the study of his word um, read the promises that Jesus has given us and to what he wants for us he's preparing a place where we have where the eye or the ear has not seen or heard of what's there for us I mean I can't imagine but I want to be there don't you I want to be there, and I want to have my wells dug deep because Satan's not giving up right now. I want to feel the peace of Jesus in my life. I want to have strength through the Holy Spirit. I'm going to come to the conclusion here. And if you've paid attention here, you'll notice that the wells have already been dug for us. You know, God does it all, doesn't he? Yeah. Amen. He's the one who's dug all these wells for us. Amen. And I can give you more text, but uh, what does Jesus offer us? The living water. And he bids us come drink freely, take freely. He offers us the living water when we're thirsty. Amen. God is the one who offers the wells necessary to quench our thirst in times of spiritual drought. Our task may be similar to that of Isaac when his, uh, the wells of his father Abraham had been stopped up by the Philistines. They had to go kind of redig those wells, didn't they? So they were to be of use. Do we need to redig the wells of our Heavenly Father? We need to stay connected to Him, don't we? Through prayer, through study, through fellowship with brethren. I want to share just a little bit of spirit of prophecy before we go. And I really liked the uh, final comments for this uh, week's lesson. She says, love, the basis of creation and redemption, is the basis of true education. This is made plain in the law that God has given as the guide of life. The first and great commandment is, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind. Luke 10, 27. To love him, <clears throat> the infinite, the omniscient one, with the whole strength and mind and heart, means the highest development of every power. It means that in the whole being, the body, the mind, as well as the soul, the image of God is to be restored. Like the first is the second commandment, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, Matthew twenty two thirty nine. The law of love calls for the devotion of body, mind, and soul to the service of God and our fellow men. And this service, while making us a blessing to others, brings the greatest blessing to ourselves. Unselfishness underlies all true development. Through unselfish service, we receive the highest culture of every faculty. More and more fully do we become partakers of the divine nature. We are fitted for heaven, for we receive heaven into our hearts. And I'm thinking, 
that great well that God has provided, his law, his commandments. And if we partake of those laws, of his commandments, he's fitting us for a life in heaven with him. Have we let the walls of salvation that God has graciously provided become stopped up in our own spiritual neglect? I pray not. But if so, dig your well before you're thirsty.